Hey everyone, this is Manly Badass Hero here, and I'm here to talk about the new Yuma Nikki game, Dream Diary. And this game is pretty decisive to say the least. You know, it has mixed reviews on Steam, um, and, and then basically there's no in-between on these reviews. They're like, it's just, it's just either one or the other. You either like it or you don't. Some people say, oh, I don't like the original, I like this one better, and other people say it tarnishes the old reputation. And I'm not going to be one of those cliches where it's like, oh, it's in the middle. It's always a neutral route. It's, you know, the bench-sitting opinion. I, I think the game is good, and I'm, but I also think it's got some critical flaws here and there. And I, I'm kind of grading the game on its own. If I had to grade it against Yumi Nikki, then, you know, obviously he gets trashed. But as a spin-off game, you know, it's not honestly not that bad. And I'm going to go actually through the entire game, and I'm going to break down each area. And what I like in each one, and what I don't like, where I think the game faltered, even for it being a spin-off. Because there's a lot of very polarizing opinions coming out, and most of them are emotionally charged. You know, most of them are very exaggerated and whatnot. I mean, it's the internet, I mean, that's how it is. But, for something as special as Yumi Nikki for a lot of people, and you know, like, I've played the original long ago, back when it first, um, basically, kind of like, started making its way around the internet. And the first videos were coming out, um, I feel like... It's important I do this. So I'll start from the areas I visited myself, since there is a slight amount of non-linearity, and I'll be breaking it down from here on. So before we get into this, I'm gonna say the obvious. Spoiler alert, this is basically gonna go for the entire game, although obviously I'm not gonna show every single instance of it, because that would take the entire playthrough's worth of footage. But we're basically gonna start right at the beginning. At the, the title screen, at the, the menu, at the opening, and this is actually pretty good. It, it does set the mood. It's not the same mood as the original, though. The original had kind of a dreamy atmosphere as soon as you hit the title screen with that song, with the minimalism of it all. This one still has that kind of minimalism in the initial title screen, but then it cuts to the room, and then it cuts to the opening as you start the game, and we wake up outside. We actually run back home. It's kind of a little mini tutorial. And then we see what is amounting to a, a giant kind of hinting that this game is a sequel right off the, the ending of the previous game. You don't quite believe this fully yet, but it, it's one of those things as you put the pieces together, you realize as you go for the game. And then you wake up, and then there is a title drop, and the opening's all perfectly fine. It sets the kind of mood without being too overdone. It is in contrast to the kind of cold opening of the original, where you're kind of just dropped in and you're kind of like wondering what's happening. But I mean everyone kind of knows what Yumaniki is, it, just, it doesn't really need that opening anymore. And the room itself is actually pretty well done, it's got a good camera angle on it to take advantage of the new three dimensions, the lighting is good, the room is ex almost pretty exactly the same, it looks lived in, they done a really good job on that actually. And it even has the original diary, it has the original songs, the balcony there. Everything here is perfectly fine. And I'm just gonna say I actually do like the graphical style of this game. Some people have said it looks kind of cheap, but I think it looks perfect. Because if it was too realistic, or too this, or too that, or too deformed, I think it would kind of lose the spirit. And the, the kind of, almost, kind of early 2000s, late 90s era, PC graphical look of this is just perfectly matches, I think, the mood that it's supposed to have. And we also have Super Nasu, which, I mean, it's Nasu. Everyone loves Nasu. So then finally, transitioning to the actual dream world, where the meats and bones of the game are, and where you're going to be coming back a lot. The main area is pretty much the same as original. There is less doors. It runs on a circular kind of thing. But it accomplishes its job just fine. Its use of kind of the circular run works. The way you kind of open the doors, you have a little preview of the area and everything. This feels like a perfectly good hub. And it is making use of the strength of its three-dimensional graphics and everything to show perspective and things that the original could not. But I mean, it's just a lobby. It's kind of hard to mess it up. But we do take note there is a lot less doors and a lot less worlds as everything's been kind of merged together. And this is probably one of the saddest things, but one of the things I guess would inevitably happen for kind of a low-budget sequel remake. But anyway, let's get into some of the worlds. So, the first world I personally went to, at least actually spent some time in, was the, the docks. 
And I'm not sure if this is supposed to be the worst first world you're supposed to go into, but this is where I went. And the docks are a lot different than the original. It's a very different, different atmosphere. The original was kind of more, kind of dreamy, kind of very neutral. And it overall seemed kind of a friendly place. Here what we have is kind of the most obvious showing off of how this game has changed. And the docks is probably one of the most gamey parts of the game. In that it has a little bit of platforming, it has enemies that chase and attack you, and it's completely linear left and right, and you push boxes. But, despite that, this is actually one of the better parts of the game in my opinion. And not in the sense that it captures the original spirit of this area, but more in the sense that it actually tries to be something new, and try to like play to that strength of that something new. And that it is kind of a side-scrolling adventure game, like in the vein of Flashback or Hard Darkness or something. So, the lighting in this area is good. It sets the mood. There is a statues in the background. There is actually a little bit of a dreamy atmosphere going on here. And thinking of Yubi Niki as in kind of a platforming game is really weird. But if you were to think of it one, this area probably captured that feeling of that world being a 2D platformer the best. But you go for this area, you avoid enemies, and I kind of felt like playing, I was playing Oddworld sometimes, because I have some of the kind of same gimmicks of where you lure them, then run really fast back and forth, and you flip switches. But you go through, and then you come across one of your first branches, and there's not too many of them in the game, compared to the original. Yeah, but it does show that the worlds are somewhat interconnected. They do try to kind of interconnect them the best they can. And considering there's less worlds, this is about as interconnected as you can get. See, so they have the train, it leads you to another area. And then you also have an NPC at the end who kind of blocks your path. And depending whether or not you know what you're doing with the money and maybe collecting the money, you can either proceed to the next area or not right away. But I went for the train because it's too tempting to go through. So that's why I'm going to cover first rather than going to the latter area. And the train is, well, the train. I mean, what can you do with it really? It's fine. It transitions into other zones, that's fine. So, the train takes you to the wilderness area from the original. And for the most part, it's a pretty faithful recreation. The wilderness area wasn't too special in the first place. I do notice it has lost a little bit of the dreaminess factor of it. But I do like it actually has a top-down perspective, not the 2D platforming segment. So, it's not a bad adaptation of the area. The original, like I said, wasn't too that special. And it has the picnic there. Great little kind of little throwback cameo. So, it like basically this area amounts to like, eh, it's alright. But anyway, you go back for the train, then you enter the barracks. And the barracks is basically the barracks from the original. Quite literally, it's the same thing. The only difference is there's a the giant Pac-Man kind of eater thing roaming around. A little bit quirky, but it's an excuse for another puzzle. It's not bad. And then if you get him to like kind of get locked up and everything, um, then the regular town of full of assistants basically arrive and it's like I said, it's, it's the barracks. That's, it's literally just the barracks. Like it's almost a faithful recreation of it. It's actually probably too faithful of a recreation in my opinion. And they could have probably done some interesting things here with it to kind of give it a little bit more of a life. They didn't, like it's a little bit too literal, sad to say. But there is a well there, and that well takes you to a new area, these kind of alley areas. And this area confuses me a little bit, because I don't really remember an area in the original that was kind of like this. I guess it's a, a take on the sewers, and maybe even the ghost world and some of the other ones. It, it's a kind of a, an odd area, and I think there's a reason it's a little bit odd. And I, I'll kind of get into that if I do a kind of story analysis video. But it's, it's definitely a hybrid area of sorts. And this is one of the ones that leans more towards the horror atmosphere. But I like this area. I think this area overall for this type of game is well done. It, it does use perspective. It uses the kind of the alleys with the enemies inside and whatnot. And it's it's not quite platforming. It's leaning more towards the adventure game thing. And it has like the little alley demons of the lights and whatnot. But overall, I like this area. It only has one weakness, and it's that shadow 
inner fear creature that appears at some point to chase you. And I don't like that being, and I'll get more into that later, but it doesn't really even add anything to that set piece because it, it chases you slow and the set piece transitions to an eyeball stampede. So the thing that chases you kind of changes part way. So like, it's just kind of there. And I, I think it's there for a plot reason, which like I said, I'll, I'll go over in a separate, maybe a separate video, but the, the eyeball chase itself is fine. And that actually remains there every time. I just feel like they kind of convoluted this section here a little bit. And then they, they kind of did a butchering of the kind of black and white kind of painting drawings. They're thrown in the background. It's more of a cameo, which is a little too bad. That, that seems to be a common thing in this game as we'll go through it. But you, you transition to a butcher shop where you get the knife and then you go into a warehouse and there's never one of those NPCs there. Once again, lean towards the horror atmosphere, but not bad adaptation. It's, it's a little bit OC-ish compared to the original game. But it's, it's perfectly serviceable and fine. In fact, if this was any other game, that'd be considered kind of a cool little spooky area. But it does a kind of weird jump cut purposely and takes you to a variation of the dense woods. And then you meet Shitai-san, as I used called, at the end there, eventually after doing a little bit of a stabbing. But it's an overall cool set piece, I'll, I'll be frank. Like, I, I was perfectly fine with this area. It's a little mysterious. It's got some little symbolism mixed in. It does greatly shrink down the wood areas, but that's not one of the areas I, I was necessarily remembering create like crazy compared to some of the other spots but that's the end of the store and overall i'd say that's actually probably the the second best to the third best of the doors in the worlds it, it borderlines on a little oc-ish like i said um you know original character do not steal but they, they did kind of mix certain areas the best they could and i think that's actually literally quite literally the best you can like actually merge and kind of shrink down those areas and make it work so transitioning back here a bit, back to the, the docks. So the docks, after you clear that NPC, becomes a bit of a weird area. You have a whole lighthouse segment where if it spots you, you blow up. And the whole concept is hilarious to me. I, I can see where they were going with this, where it's supposed to kind of like add tension to this area. It's a very quirky choice for the nature of Yumi Nikki to kind of have this. It's not bad. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily good either. And like I said, it's very gamey. When this game gets a little too gamey, I feel, I feel like I don't like it as much. It, need, it does need a little bit of a game factor, but it has to be very careful about where it uses it. And sometimes it's heavy-handed and sometimes it's more subtle. So, this area transitions to the Witch's Island in an almost very natural, seamless transition. And the Witch's Island wasn't necessarily that big of a special area, so this area is pretty cool. It's got a little atmospheric effects. It does do some little tricks with the trees kind of blocking the camera and the NPCs kind of in the background. And it, it's one of the instances where they did, kind of knew what, where to go with the art design to kind of show something, I feel like. There's also the Ao Oni secret here. Kind of a, kind of a random addition, but fun I thought was funny. But it does transition to Snow World. And for anyone who likes that world, it's... Snow World's been heavily gutted. Although I suppose their goal here was to show a almost nature-like transition, like biomes or something, like in a survival game where the docks lead to the forest, which give way to, like, snow. But as far as the snow world goes, it's, like I said, it's, it's been gutted. It, it's just literally a patch of snow and then an glue. Depending on your, how much you were fond of that world, you could say, like, well, they had to squeeze it in where they could, or maybe they should be them a little bit more, because, I mean, it is just a snow texture, they could theoretically have expanded that. But you got the one igloo there, just one, and like the original, the igloo leads to the Pink Sea. And that brings us to the most well-executed thing this entire game does. It's so well-executed, that I would not mind uh, a, an actual Yumaniki remake, like a natural remake, not a, a spiritual sequel or something weird, that is made like this. Because, first off, if you actually look at the original map of the Pink uh, Sea, this is a 
actual literal interpretation of it, as in, almost the entirety of the pink sea is represented in some form, down to even the island shapes and the area. And not only is it well represented, it takes advantage of the, the 3D plane and the nature of this game and kind of takes off the wheels so you're not locked to 2D going left and right. You can go around all over. And it uses its camera angles really well in that this area felt like it was actually handcrafted, like it was directed by a human being. Because the camera moves in such a way where it kind of scans the horizon and kind of directs you to the next area at the same time. And it works well with the original music. It gives you a sense of scale of this whole entire ocean. It gives a little bit of a power. And then you have the balloons and you grab the balloon and the balloon itself is somewhat guided in its camera to kind of show a sense of scale to kind of direct you. And it doesn't lock you into control. Like you can control that balloon. Like you can physically dive that balloon and you into the water. Although it somewhat does road wheel a little bit to kind of push you to the next island. But they could have gone easily here, just having you like pick up the balloon and you just automatically like a cutscene go to the next island. They gave you a little bit of control over it. It's hard to fail with it, but that sense of having a little bit of control kind of like keeps the immersion for the player. It doesn't like break you out of it where you like you like go of the keyboard like, oh I'm on the balloon, I just wait till it's over. You feel like, oh I'm actually exploring the the pink sea. It, it's really actually extraordinarily well done and I, I if I had a choice, if the entire game was like this, let's say there was even less worlds than even this game had, and each one was it had this much accuracy and detail, um, you you could have actually seen a pretty definite version of Yuuniki. But like I said, th this area is well done. It's well directed, and it leads, of course, to one of the most notorious and frankly one of the things that probably made the original so famous. Uh, you basically go to the the Yuboa room, Ponoko. And as you initially go into the room, the room is actually really well done too. It's a faithful recreation. It's got the camera angle right against the camera to kind of show the room while also still giving a sense of three dimensions. Ponoko is there. She reacts. She's not just a static RPG maker or sprite. And this whole s section could have been actually perfect to kind of like perfectly end off the pink sea. And then of course we get to the very disappointing take on Oboa. Because, first off, the original Oboa being found is supposed to be semi-accidental. And you're not supposed to naturally find it. It's something you have to do a little bit something a little obnoxious to do. Although everyone knows how to get it, so like they obviously couldn't do that. Secondly, they make the room completely dark, so I guess they don't want to show the Oboa model. As people have asked me if you can use the lantern to kind of see it, I tried it. I didn't was able to get anything, but maybe I was doing it wrong. So, uh, as far as I know, I don't think they made, even made an Oboa model. And there's different ways you can kind of think about this. It's such a hyped up part of the game. And if they kind of made it like a weird, like three dimensional thing, that probably would have looked a little bit goofy. But I would like to see them try to do something creative. Because the way they did it, I could tell that they were trying to like reach at straws about how to make this scene original, but also keeping the original spirit. And they, they kind of just made like a, a flasher. And it's, it's so fast, it's like a blink if you miss it kind of thing. And it has now the original kind of spirit of that scene. And Oboa is partially scary, not because Oboa itself is scary, but because it's just such a surreal, random thing that occurs. So I think making it kind of like a flashing screen thing really kills that spirit. Like, they butchered Oboa. Of all the things in this game, that is actually the most ruined scene. And on top of that, you don't even get the cool, kind of, monochrome area. I believe it's called the, uh... It's not... I don't think it's called the White Desert. I think it's supposed to be something similar to that, but... It's just kind of its own area. You have some weird drawing in the background and everything, and it just kind of loops forever and you're kind of stuck there. That's the original. So that's been completely gutted, and all the areas actually kind of like that have been gutted, and that's actually something that should have not been done, period. Because those areas, I think, are pretty important for establishing the dreamlike atmosphere of how dreams, a lot of times, you don't really have much control over them. You kind of transition to each other fast. There was a game called Lovely Sweet Dream Simulator, and you can look that up. Because, you know, obviously everyone calls it from a different name. But that game captured that perfectly, and you and Nikki captured that pretty well. And that, they kind of missed the ball on doing that here. And that also brings me to another point. You can't stab at anyone with the knife. There's only a few very specific NPCs that you can stab. So the knife itself has lost a lot of its purpose. It's only for use for two separate collectible slash puzzles. 
and it's purely in there for just a throwback, so it's very underused. So, that's the pink sea anyway. Going back a bit, this is about when I revisited the, the alley area as I call it, and you can actually find Monaco here. And Monaco's kind of a, I kind of have a mixed opinion on this sequence or anything. It has the bed area, and I suppose it's a sensible place to kind of like stick her. They made her into the basically equivalent of a spooky NPC, and she was kind of like that originally. They lost a bit of the dreamy effect to her, like a lot of things in this game. And I think they lost kind of an opportunity to, ironically, have a full screen kind of screamer kind of thing, because that's what she originally was. So Obola gets turned into the full screen screamer, but Monaco is just a, a spooky NPC. So I feel like there was a weird directorial thing that happened here. But she does initiate a chase scene, there's a bit of a puzzle to it where you have to purposely let her get close by, so the beds lift up. I actually did like that, and that's kind of a little cool of a cool gimmick. So, mixed bag interpretation of her. And she's also a little bit too blue, I guess it made it so it's really easier for you to like navigate around her. But it, it takes away a little bit of the monochrome look she's supposed to have, so... No neon blue, please. Okay, next area. Mural World. Terrible. Now, it's it's okay, it's not really that bad, but Mural World only kind of works when it seems big and expansive. It is an accurate interpretation of Mural World, but since it's so constrained, it loses its point. In that, whoa, it's a lot of murals in a big, expansive, kind of sparse forest, and when it's just a hallway, there's no point to Mural World. Although, I give him credit for trying to squeeze it in somehow. There is the new NPC in here that is actually designed directly by Kikiyama. It doesn't really do much. It's kind of there, but then again, a lot of you Miniki NPCs are, so... It's kind of cool to see someone new. But, next world! The Mall! The Mall is a overall pretty accurate representation of the Mall. Once again, it's another area that wasn't particularly very interesting in the original, so it's not too much you can kind of go wrong with it. Our little bucket friend is there, the little lobby area with the the kind of... You, you get the fluid and everything is there, and it's accurate. So, the mall's okay. It does lose a bit of its sense of exploration, as it's just basically a, a kind of chase, the NPC area. But aside from that, it's fairly accurate. It's basically a mediocre area. But it does transition to a, a warehouse area where you... You do kind of a don't blink, avoid the mannequins, the spooky mannequins kind of thing. And on one hand, the gimmick of the darkness and then moving forward, and then you kind of hear them shifting and everything, like they're not just teleporting, they actually are shifting to get you, is cool. On the other, it doesn't quite fit in with showing just a dreamy atmosphere. So I'm going to give this area a grade of it's a good gamey area. It's a bad exploratory cool area. So out of all the areas as far as game like, it's actually one of the better ones. But as far as doing what they could do for an adaptation, it's kind of mediocre. Next, we have the Sky Garden Zone. Sky Garden is basically a faithful kind of adaptation of the area. Obviously all the areas are shorter than the original, whether they're more linear or they're just kind of cut down if they originally were linear, but it's basically Sky Garden. It's a good area, it's got some good lighting, you get the umbrella here, it's a little scenic, you have the correct NPCs, it's fine, and you even have the flowers at the end, it's, and it's a good kind of way of ending it, that's a little bit dreamy and kind of fits somewhat with the atmosphere of the original. I'm also going to quickly point out here, this is a little bit of a kind of a jump skip as far as subject, I really like the Aoni little mini game is a silly, stupid easter egg, but I thought it was a nice little touch because it's so stupidly accurate to being what Aoni is. So, I liked it. It's fun. Easter eggs are always fine. But on a more serious note, let's go to the one of the final areas, which is the school. And this is one of the areas that's kind of locked away Metroidvania style, as that's kind of a thing this game does. And the school starts off initially a little bit promising. It is a normal school. It is a little bit dreamy and kind of peaceful and serene. Although it doesn't really do anything necessarily exciting, it is, well, like I said, it feels like a dream school. 
but it does transition to what I believe is one of the frankly worst areas in this game. Because when I play this game, while I'm going through it, I do feel like certain areas could like improve on the atmosphere or where they present things. This area is one of the ones where I feel like I was not having fun. Because up to this point, I was always at least having fun. I was always at least enjoying myself, at least on a game sense. The kind of dark version of the school and what I believe is a take on kind of the light area of the original game, although done in a very weird way, is miserable to me. Because the puzzles aren't necessarily hard, but they're just so dark. And I guess that might be also the dark area? Like, it's like it's a few hybrid of a few areas. But it's way too dark for what is an adventure game, and it does not work like the original of having like dark areas. So it just becomes, I can't see anything. You. You give me the thing to light up the areas part way through, and even then the thing doesn't light up areas. It's more of a Metroidvania puzzle piece for getting some secrets and some items later. So I basically don't even see most of this area. I ever see it just as a, a glowy red thing, or blackness. Like literal, you cannot see what you're doing, and it's not based on gamma or anything else. It is literally done like that on purpose to add some difficulty to the puzzles, and I don't like that. I like the NPC that they've used throughout the area. Uh, Manoi, or Mano, I, I believe, I'm not sure you, you say most of these names from original. The way you follow her is fine, the way she has a big role for this area is fine, but this area is poorly designed from a game standpoint, and the things they tried to do for atmosphere did not save it from that. Frankly, one of the, the worst worlds, and I would have almost preferred it if it was just a linear hallway at that rate. But you transition to basically QQ gun stairs, where you finally confront the one NPC here. You have that whole kind of polishing cutscene that happens, and it's a faithful re recreation of QQ gun. I mean, is it any better than that? And the little cutscene you get is leaning towards the horror end, but it's fine. I liked it. It definitely fits the atmosphere this game is trying to go for, without being just a blinky blinky screamer like Oboa. But anyway, that leads us to the final area I have not talked about, and that is the, the final door that you unlock by going through all the doors and getting the major final cutscenes in each one, because of the game's kind of linear nature. And I'm not sure what you would call this world, I guess it's apartment world, and this is one of the areas that I think is supposed to slap over your head that this is a sequel, and kind of like, like I've said before, kind of show that it's possible that you can have a apartment dream within the apartment dream within the apartment dream and you don't know like what's real and what's not and that actually is good that that's actually pretty cool and it kind of fills out some lower parts the part i don't like about this world is that they don't do anything interesting with it so most of the doors are locked a few of them just lead to like rooms with like a singular bed and like some secrets or something secret and they, they could have definitely done something with maybe the doors each room being kind of very different and maybe we'll get lost in the apartment, and then maybe even like, let's say you go like enter another door towards the end of a hallway, and it leads you into a room that looks like your room also. So, they could have really messed with the player's mind here, and made them kind of like, lose their senses. But they don't really do that, it's just a very linear path, and the shadow being comes out and he's like, roar, and he chases you down the hallway, and the box is hitching in the face. And uh, it's such a typically gamey spot, and I don't really like the shadow interfere being at all. And it's kind of a squandering of what this area could be, which is very sad. And then eventually you get up to the roof, and there's a transition here of where the endings happen, but we'll get into that later. And then you go to the edge of the roof, and it's kind of a throwback, I guess, to when you can do like the witch effect, and I'll get into the effects later, that's another point. The only difference is that you use the umbrella now, which of course is a, a double jump gliding mechanic, very gamey. And the, the shadow being also bursts to the roof while this is going on, of course. Because, you know, it has to be a game. And it goes, roar! I'm bursting for the roof now! And then you kind of do this platforming area where the dream's collapsing. And the dream collapsing thing... Actually, I, I actually kind of like that. It, it does add a little bit of tension. But the platforming here is bad. You have to kind of like use your shadow to navigate it, but it's pretty buggy. I feel for the, the floor once. I'm sure they fixed it by now. But I would have preferred, rather than having your literal inner fears chase you with a giant rawr monster, I would have preferred if it was just the dream collapsing. And rather being less stormy and full of tension, it should have seemed a little bit more 
kind of insane and surreal. Like, almost like the world is unsupporting itself. And, like, the logic of even an illogical dream world is not supporting itself anymore. Like, like there's a glitch in the system, almost. Like, it's your, your dream's forgetting to fill in the, the blanks. So the world... Like, the road's not fully filled in, and there's, like, things from other worlds kind of, like, floating around. Like, that could have been interesting. But no, it, it's kind of a generic, the world's collapsing, the, the war monster chases you. Uh, it actually reminds me a lot of the finale of the recent Hello Neighbor. I know it has no relation to it, and it's not probably not influenced by it. It's a very typical trope. But they both do the same exact thing, where a giant shadow rar monster chases you as your world collapses. And I don't like that gimmick. But it does redeem itself at the very end, when you jump off, and you kind of... It, it's a le leap of faith, you're not sure if you're supposed to jump off or not, but you have to kind of take it, because there's nowhere else to go. And as you, you leap off, you see the original lobby, and like because it's like lit up, you kind of recognize a circular pattern, and you're thinking, I gotta go there. Because the lobby is always, even the original, is a safe zone. It's weirdly comforting in this place, it's your access to all the different dream worlds, so by you seeing the lobby, you think, this is where I need to go instantly. This is a safe zone. But as you get closer, the lights start blinking out on it, the music tension still stays up, and as you get down there, only light left is the one back to your own world. And that is, that's well done. Like I said, the part leading up to it could have been done better. Because I don't think Yumi Niki needs a final boss chase in the first place. They could have done a better way of representing interferes and doing like a big plot review of, I think they were trying to do of that than the giant shadow rar monster. And then you cut to something that I think is gonna be very controversial as more people play this game and get to the ending. You cut to the ending that completely throws out the old one. And like I said, if you go by my fear of this being a sequel, it basically has a completely different emotional impact, which is depending on your mileage may be better or may be worse. But our character lives. She goes out into the world supposedly, or she's going to the the heaven, depending on your interpretation of it. So at least on a happier note, it, it's kind of a mixed bag in a sense that it doesn't have the emotional sudden impact of the original, but I don't think you can just recreate the original ending. The shock's already gone, so it's a little interesting to see them take on a different take of it. And there is one other thing, there is the other ending, the, the secret ending, where you find our old friend, Sekom Masada Sensei, the, the alien from the original. He is the alternate ending. I have a personal theory of why he's the alternate ending and not just because he's an Easter egg. And it has somewhat to do with the other adaptations of Yumaniki. I think they, they borrowed from them a little bit. Not fully, but I feel like there's a little bit of borrowing in there. Like I said, I'm, I'm gonna probably do a separate video just talking about the story. But it's a accurate representation of it. It's nice. I think it's one of the better areas in the game because I like the original also. It's calming, she just kind of goes down, goes to sleep, and that's the ending. And that's perfectly fine for a secret ending. No complaints here about that. But anyway, that sums up the entirety of the game, area by area. I'm gonna make do some quick general opinions here about some things. And I, I want to definitely say like, it may seem like I'm actually picking on the game. You might think, well look at Manly, you pointing out all these bad points about the game. Shouldn't it be a terrible game? And I say no, because even at its worst, it's not a bad game. But, to sum it up, some areas are good, some are bad, some are really well done, can make up just for, even just seeing those areas can make up for some of the other parts. Uh, and the overall general thing I would say is, I'm very upset they took out some of the more psychedelic areas. Almost all of them are gutted, or they're just very small cameos in the background, and I think those areas are very important for the atmosphere of this game and like some of its artistic imagery. And I think there's a partial reason they did take some of them out. And I don't think it's because they ran out on budget, but I, I do think there might have been some health issues related to some of them. Because if anyone knows, like, Japan, after, like, some of these scares, is very concerned about seizures. And I think they felt like some of the areas, if to do them justice, would basically turn them into a giant seizure warning. Where they'd have to be nerfed down, and I think they thought, well, let's not dedicate any resources to that, let's just, like, do some of the other areas better. And just kind of, like, quick cameo in the background. It doesn't explain why some of the more monochrome areas are not there. I think that is actually just they ran out of time and budget. But 
Sadly, that's probably the reason we don't have the cooler kind of like Aztec rave monkey or any of those kind of things done any justice. And those were some of my favorite areas, which is sad, but it is what it is. And the ever general thing I want to say is the effects are all gone, except the ones that have tool based uses. And I guess that's because this is a completely different beast, and the effects hunting has been kind of replaced by the concept art hunting. And if you like finding shinies, it is actually pretty decent for finding shinies. I think they should have had some of the original effects in. I don't see there's a reason for you not to have them as some form of a little collectible. They don't have to do anything. They just need to be a cosmetic that you can put on our main character. So like, you could play the game with like, cat ears or a cat tail. It doesn't have to do anything. Just like little easter eggs you can just find. That would have been nice. And I'm not quite sure what the directorial reason for that would be. Maybe they're trying to make it a little more realistic. Maybe they're trying to, try to show like it's supposed to be separate from the original and not try to be too close to it. Because it's kind of like cemented in like it's a reimagining sequel. But that is a shame. And they took out some of the fun when it comes to that. Even the, the, the effects they do give you do not transform yourself. They're actual literal items. And they could have had a little more whimsy with things like that. To kind of finish off the general opinion, the original Yubiniki is a great dream kind of simulator. The new one, kind of a, a solidish adventure kind of side scrolling game with a couple of weak spots, but it's nowhere near bad or anything. And I, I think if the original Yumaniki didn't exist, would this game be higher reviewed? A little bit. I don't think it would be discussed to death and everything like the original was and have like all these communities built around it, obviously. But I'm sure it would have actually had some form of success, especially since there's YouTubers and whatnot. And I'm sure a lot of people would make me videos of like, new hit side-scrolling game, just like Limbo. But then that would have been kind of the end of that. So, does this game seem worse because the original exists? Yes. Would people consider this kind of a fun, interesting game and world if the original didn't exist? Yes. So that's my breakdown of the uh, entire game. And basically what it amounts to is, and I, I'm going to kind of go about my opinions about uh, some things related to uh, fandoms in general and how people receive things. But... What it kind of comes down to is that Yumi Niki, the uh, Dream Diary, is, I keep saying it's basically Mega Man Legends to the Mega Man and Mega Man X games. It's something kind of like that. It's not so much a game that's made to kind of poo-poo on the past. And there are, you know, like, I think I can see why people are more hostile. So back in the day, when you had these kind of spin-off games or these other games coming out when the transition to 3D was happening, there was a lot less hostility towards these things because people were excited. They were like, whoa, let's see what they can do with this uh, favorite property. I I'm sure there were some people who didn't like it. But for the most part, people were excited back then. And, you know, you arguably had some good games come out, but a little different. I mean, that's how Mario 64 came about. So, but now you've had some arguably, probably not even arguably, you've had some kind of very bad remakes or ones that kind of miss the atmosphere. Or you've had sequels or rebootings, and these games kind of like Capcom is notorious for this, like DMC or The Lost Planet reboot or something they did. You you have these type of games that are coming on to kind of poo poo on the past. I keep using that word. I probably shouldn't. It'll probably be a little more elegant to say, but and those are kind of sinister reimaginings or reboots or sequels. Those are designed to kind of tell the fans that what you liked is bad. And that what we like, or what we want to make the series into and kind of direct it, is good. They're they're insulting its roots and what makes a game originally good. And Dream Diary is not that. It's... You could argue it's a cash-in. I'm sure I've seen a lot of people say it, like, it's a cash-in. Made them made money on the Yumi Nikki name. And, by all arguments, it is. It's the same thing of merchandise, like, merchandise is technically cashing in on a property, and if a publisher pays money for that, they are in their right to technically make games and make money off a property they've paid for. So I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Obviously, it could be a lot worse. So this is not too bad, like, this is not terrible cash-in. 
if I start seeing Yumaniki Gacha games and all sorts of terrible things like that, then then I would say everyone has a reason to cry. But this is just kind of it's a little thing for the fans, and that's what they advertised it as. And for that, it's fine. It's not terrible. It's not even necessarily even forgettable or mediocre. It's about I would say the equivalent of like around 7.0 to like 8.0, 8.0 rather, as far as game quality. And I mean, with modern game reviewing, that's what it'd be. If it was it was the 90s, and you were like looking at game magazines and whatnot, then it'd probably be about 6.0. But you know, the review scores and the bell curve and all that have changed, so that's gonna be what we'd be. It's not gonna be something that you're gonna be talking about years later, like Yumanique itself. That doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna be lost to time. It's gonna be probably remembered in some form as, oh, that was a thing. But I mean, I, that's why I liked it. I mean, I liked it for what it was. It's kind of fun. Did some parts bad, did some parts good. Certainly did not regret paying twenty dollars. I know some people think that's a lot of money for this, but it's it's a fair price. If, and if you don't like it, you can always get it on sale. It is, you know, those always come up. But the important thing is to not be disingenuous towards this game. To I believe everyone should give it at least a fair shake. Give it a try. Watch a YouTube video. Watch mine. Make your own decisions. Try not to let your kind of like emotions and past the ties to the previous game, which obviously is very well made as far as atmosphere thing. Kind of cloud that. Just see it as a spin-off sequel. Kind of. And it's a thing. It's kind of fun to see a few scenes, a butch of and it's a thing. And this is coming from someone who, I mean, I mean, you can see my, my game collection. I, I'm definitely a person who likes original works and retro things and likes to experience memories again and like always thinks of them fondly and I see a lot of this in the reviews for Yuminiki on Dream Diary people will say like Yuminiki changed my life or it was such a magical game and everything and or like I really enjoyed the community and the searching of the secrets and that that's all there there like I said you're not being replaced with some kind of sinister reboot and maybe maybe one will come down the line maybe they'll say well we're gonna make a bunch of sequels of Yuminiki and they're gonna be all like this <laughs> Then, then we all get the pitchforks and we burn down Katakawa and Studio Dean, apparently, is in there. But, you know, your your memories are going to be there. Just appreciate the fun and the, the atmosphere and everything you had with the original. That's why I kind of say, like, this makes me kind of appreciate the original just that much more. Um, and like I said, coming back from someone who enjoys retro games, who has so many memories tied to games and gaming culture and communities and whatnot. Um, all the memories, all the ways I've experienced gaming are long dead. You know, a lot of these type of retro games, they don't make games like this anymore. The arcade scene's long dead. Um, gaming magazines are dead. And like, old gaming videos, they're all gone. But, you know, they're just memories I hold on to and appreciate. And that's what they are. And I just move on and I enjoy the next game. And Yui Niki, the original, is always going to be something we'll remember. So, I hope that can kind of cool some of the tempers I see flying out there. And just to iterate, you know, uh, I'm not uh, I'm not being paid by the developers to talk a little bit better about the game or anything. I wasn't given a free copy. I have no ties to these publishers, despite being a YouTuber or anything. Like I, I like I said, I, I enjoy it. You know, if other people don't, I mean, that's their opinion. Like I said, I just wish, hope everyone gives a little bit of a fair shake. Try it. See if you like it or not. But that's pretty much it. But anyway, that's... It for me talking about Yuminiki Dream Diary, at least as far as a review goes. If you have your own opinions or anything, then feel free to leave them in the comments. I guarantee you I probably will read every single one of them, whether it's negative or positive or whatnot, or I disagree with you, Manly. Leave me your opinion. Go for it. Discussion's good. I mean, that's why the original Yuminiki probably did as well as like people discussed it. But yeah, that's it. I'm done talking. So anyway, I'll see you guys later. Hope you enjoyed. Take it easy. I do the manly dance now.